if okay with everyone. We'll go back. Good afternoon. Welcome to what I think is the third event in our uh, Hot of the Presses series featuring Michelle Salzman and her new book, The Falls of Rome, Crises, Resilience, and Resurgence in Late Antiquity, which is a book that takes a closer look and I hear it deconstructs Edward Gibbon's consequential 18th century uh, narrative of the decline and fall in Rome of, of Rome in the year 467. Um, my name is Jeanette Kohl. I'm co-director of the Center for Ideas and Society. And when I'm wearing my other hat, I'm an art historian uh, of the Italian Renaissance, so a time period that has plenty of overlap, I dare say, with um, ancient Rome. So at the uh, center, we support humanistic inquiry that on the one hand explores new angles of research for the future, but also um, those that challenge paradigms of the past. And I think we have a really good example of such um, a challenging of paradigms here already, you know, um, to be seen in the title, the falls, plural, of Rome. Uh, my welcome today comes from our offices on UCR campus located on the traditional homelands of the Cahuilla, Tongva, Luiseno, and Serrano peoples with our deep gratitude for the opportunity of living and working here. Um, this meeting will be recorded, it is being recorded, and we ask everyone except for the speaker to please mute their microphones. If you uh, wish to have closed captioning, that is available through the Zoom menu. Also, um, you know, we have the chat, so please feel free to drop questions uh, for the speaker in the chat as they occur to you. But of course, you'll also have um, the opportunity to ask questions, so unmute yourself and ask questions at the end. Um, I'll give a very brief introduction, introduce Michelle, and then she will talk for about a half hour about her book, after which we have um, 20, 25 minutes left for discussion. Um, I was almost going to say my next um, guest does not need an introduction, because when I looked it up, <laughs> Michelle uh, has been at UCR for 20, almost 27 years, um, so most of us <laughs> know her. Uh, for those who don't, let me introduce her. She is currently the chair of the Department of History at UCR. And before uh, coming here in 1995, she taught at Swarthmore College, at Columbia University, and at Boston University. Her research focuses on the religious and social history of late antiquity. She's the author of numerous articles, too many to mention here, and four substantial books on Roman time, the codex calendar of 345 and the rhythms of urban life in late antiquity of 1990, the making of a Christian aristocracy with Harvard University Press 2002, the letters of Simakos book, book one for which she wrote an introduction and a commentary uh, of 2012, and most recently, The Falls of Rome with Cambridge University Press. She's also senior editor of the Cambridge History of Religions in the Ancient World, volumes one and three. Michelle has received a large number of fellowships, and I mentioned only a few, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Council for Learned Societies, the American Philosophical Society, the Whiting Foundation, the American Academy in Rome, and the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where the two of us had a great time together in 2018 as fellows. Um, she was elected chair of the Council of the School of Humanities of the American Academy uh, in Rome in 2013, and she's also a trustee. Uh, and she serves as associate editor for Studies in Late Antiquity, a journal. And before I uh, give the floor to Michelle, just um, a couple of ideas that occurred to me when uh, looking at her book as a fan of ancient Roman history. So we all learn in school about the rise and inevitable fall of human cultures and civilizations, like on the medieval wheel of fortune, what comes up must go down, must come down, but how and why do things come down? And what types of narratives shape our perception of rise, decline, and then the ultimate fall of nations of rulers and political systems? And of course, uh, when looking at a topic like this, um, contemporary 
parallels contemporary politics spring to mind and much has been written and said recently about the decline of the United States uh, political system, the events of January 6th, America's shrinking, uh, allegedly shrinking global influence. Um, and meanwhile, the Russians are saber rattling um, on the Ukrainian border. And I think foreign invasions are probably the most visible sign of a loss of control and sovereignty in any culture at any time. But the question is what goes on on the inside in uh, the government circles and the political elites after such visible losses of power of control, control and how do cultures defend and keep expressing their very own values through and after invasions and in the face of toppled political systems. So the question, what actually falls and what does not? And I think Michelle will have some answers for us ready and the stage is all yours. Michelle, welcome. Well, thank you. And thank you for that lovely introduction, Jeanette. And I wanna thank the center for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to uh, share my most recent um, book with you all. And I look forward to the questions and comments. Um, uh, and um, uh, it is indeed it is indeed with with an eye to the contemporary moment that uh, that this book um, has has taken shape, um, and I hope that it leads to some interesting conversations with you all. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to to begin to talk a little bit about my book, The Falls of Rome, uh, and what I, what I think it has to offer. Since the 18th century, uh, historians have engaged in a very lively debate about the utility of Edward Gibbon's paradigm of decline and fall to describe the last centuries of the Western Roman Empire. Gibbon's multi-volume history of the decline and fall of Rome interpreted the Germanic invasions as the triumph of barbarism. And as many of you already know, he blamed Christianity for destroying Rome's strong military and civic virtues. Books like that of Brian Ward Perkins and um, have, uh, have um, really provi uh, revived Gibbon's um, uh, influential interpretive framework. Brian Ward Perkins' book, The End, The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization, argue that similarly, that Germanic invasions put an end to Roman civilization. This catastrophist approach is famously at odds with an alternative understanding by historians like that of Peter Brown, uh, who's, um, who has argued for a, um, a notion that I would loosely call um, continuity, uh, the continuous, who argue for the ongoing vitality of Rome's legal and cultural institutions, and especially the impact of innovations in religion. Um, a third perspective has also emerged um, that, that argues that dismisses both these paradigms is no less than the Western theft of history. And they argue we have to use a comparative framework involving not just the entire Mediterranean, but also China. In my view, none of these approaches captures the creative resilience of this period. The impact of individual and collective choices during these pivotal three centuries is significant. So to move beyond these well-known narratives, narratives, I focus instead on the elites who contested to rebuild Rome, the city, and its empire following military and political disasters. And I emphasize not the collapse of Rome, Jeanette was right, but its resilience. It is true that the Western Roman Empire fell, but not for a century and a half after many date its demise. And I focus on the city of Rome and not on a subset of cities or the Western Empire writ large because Rome's influence shaped the outlines of its Mediterranean empire in late antiquity, that is the period from roughly 300 to 700, Rome was still the largest city in the Western Mediterranean and an imperial capital with a resident aristocracy and prestigious institutions that had enabled Rome to control its empire since at least the third century BC. So the city remained in late antiquity in the words of Robert Marcus as quote, the head center and sum of the world. In my recently, very recently published book, The Falls of Rome, 
Crises, Resilience, and Resurgence in Late Antiquity, I examined five political and military crises that ancient and modern historians have considered critical for understanding Rome's decline and fall. I devoted chapter to each of these crises, um, three chapters, in fact, to the fifth century, the famous sack of Rome in 410 by Alec and Lagos, the 455 Vandal sack, and then the 476 um, event. Um, although the fortunes of Rome's leaders, its senators, emperors, generals, and bishops ebbed and flowed in a city which suffered population loss, senatorial aristocracy remained at the center of the city's recovery. The resilience of Roman senatorial aristocrats, who time and again used their resources to fuel the city's resurgence, is, I think, meaningful and also moving. It's a very definition of resilience used by historians and social scientists who study societal responses to environmental shocks like plague and climate change. In my book, however, I use the term resilience to consider how Roman elites adapted to the military and political crises that overtook the city of Rome. To fully understand the resilience of the Roman senatorial aristocracy, however, we have to take into account that they themselves were the products of a culture in which competition acted as a stimulant. Crises brought about changes that rendered politics in the late antique city more diffuse and variable. Personal relations played an even greater role than they had previously in winning power and building social networks that enabled material and political advancement. This competition energized rather than innovated senator aristocrats. It's times, it's true, their actions led to disaster, but their intervention also allowed for the recovery of urban life and Roman society. Some scholars have emphasized the growing power of the church during this period. But as I show, the bishops of Rome, also known as the popes, remained weak civic leaders until much, much later. Their efforts um, focused rather on rebuilding the church, not the city. We can appreciate the challenges that the Romans face. After all, Rome suffered of no less than five major crises due to invasions and civil war in this period between the fourth and the sixth centuries. And I consider the civil war between the first Christian emperor Constantine and Maxentius fought outside the walls of the city in 312, the first major challenge to uh, the recovery and the survival of Rome. But in each successive crisis, the city led by its senatorial elites rebounded and preserved its civic institutions and Roman identity. And this history, I believe, has relevance to the continuing crises that we see in America today, to which I will return at the end of my talk. So to give you some sense of what's involved, I'm gonna turn now to one particular moment and a particular crisis. The conventional date for the fall of Rome uh, is 476. Edward Gibbon thought that in fact, he might end his narrative there. The date is chosen because that's when the last boy emperor, Romulus, also known as Augustulus, um, went into exile. He left Rome. In my view, however, the crisis that emerged in 470, which culminated in a civil war in the year 472 fought in Rome, was arguably the most devastating fall of the city in the fifth century. This fighting divided families as well as the population and it wrecked havoc on the urban landscape. Nonetheless, the willingness of senators to return to Rome and to work with the military laid the groundwork for the recovery of the city. So I argue in the aftermath of the civil war 472 and by 476, the traditional date for the fall of Rome, by that date, senator aristocrats were united to restore the city and its institutions, that is the Senate and the church. And moreover, the resilience of senators after 472 had wide ranging consequences. As senatorial aristocrats, they crafted a new working relationship with the military um, and that enabled the rise of a Germanic kingdom in Italy by 476 with senatorial aristocrats willing to hold the very same high offices 
that would enable them to govern Italy on behalf now of these new German rulers. At the same time, Centro Riscats also reworked their relationship with the bishops and the church in Rome. Now, senators were directly involved in meetings on papal succession. Now, as we'll see, they also played a very active role in what became the first major break between the Eastern Bishop of Rome in Constantinople, that is the Patriarch, and the Western, uh, excuse me, the Eastern Bishop of Constantinople and the Western Bishop of Rome. It's what is today known as the Acacian Schism, the controversy of the correct definition of Christ's divinity. And we'll see how central aristocrats in the aftermath of 472 virtually reshaped the religious life of Rome and the Christianity practice there through their involvement in this schism. So what happened in 472 and why is it important? To get some sense of, of the uh, how life had changed, um, I think that we should look at the map of Rome. The maps are always useful. The Western Empire at this date was reduced to mostly the sort of purple sections, um, most of Italy, a part of um, southern Gaul, a bit of um, North Africa. Um, the Eastern Empire, focused on Constantinople, was largely intact, however. The shrinking of the Western Empire in the fifth century, with its renewed focus on Italy, placed an even greater emphasis on the city of Rome. In fact, in the 440s, Western emperors and generals returned to reside in Rome, seeking stability and the support, I argue, of Roman senators. The Eastern Emperor, of course, remained in Constantinople. In the year 470, uh, the Western Emperor was a man by the name of Procopius Anthemius. Um, Anthemius had been sent with the approval of the Eastern Emperor, Emperor uh, he, he brought to the West uh, troops and gold, and he won the support of a number of, of senators, in fact. And he also won the support of um, Ricimer, whose monogram on this bronze uh, is uh, less than perfect, but that's about the best we have for him. Um, anyway, Ricimer is a German by birth, um, has spent his whole career at the top echelons of power in the service of Rome. Scholars wonder why he accepted Anthemius as the new emperor, but I would argue that this was in fact a good deal for him. Ricimer retained control of his troops while Anthemius went off to fight the Vandals in North Africa. And in fact, this deal was sealed with a kiss. Anthemius, uh, Anthemius's daughter married Ricimer and their children would go on, hopefully, to uh, lead to dynastic succession. So in short, Rigmer would retain power in the service of the emperor as he had done for the past 20 years. Unfortunately, the arrangement didn't last. Tensions arose between the general and the emperor and the military expedition to, against the Vandals failed. When Anthemius grew dangerously ill, he alleged a conspiracy by Rigmer and his friends whom he executed without a trial. Negotiations failed. Ricimer marched on Rome and sieged Anthemius within, within the city for some five months. Anthemius held out at first, expecting reinforcements from the east. He had his own supporters. We know of senators um, and their retainers, as well as the populace at large who fought with Anthemius. Other senators sided with Ricimer. As time wore on, Anthemius was forced to do battle outside the walls of the city. We hear from our sources anywhere from 10 to 20,000 men fought on both sides. But the fighting in 472 was more destructive to the urban fabric than the more famous sack of Rome in 410. Then the Gothic leader Alaric had entered the city without a battle. And as an Aryan Christian, he didn't slaughter the inhabitants. But in 472, the city itself became a battlefield. Ricimer and his men were camped across uh, in, in the Vatican and in Trastevere areas. And Themius and his supporters were in Rome, mostly on the Palatine Hill. In, um, in what was a um, major battle that was fought around the modern castle San Angelo, we hear of the man of Ricimer 
hurling down statues from the top of the, of the castle. Um, Wickmer had turned it into a fortress, which is what it is today. The result was not good for Anthemius, who tried to flee. He was caught in modern Trastevere in San Cosogono and beheaded by the nephew of Wickmer. Uh, and that was the end of Anthemius. The men, Wickmer's uh, men, though, uh, looted the city for several days. And unlike an earlier crisis, uh, this time the Bishop of Rome didn't intervene. There is absolutely no um, text that mentions what a Bishop Simplicius of Rome did. He's entirely missing from the scene. In the aftermath of what one later fifth century Pope called civil madness, Roman senators and military elites acted quickly. The surviving senators uh, returned to Rome and lent their support to the general Wickmer and the man whom he had designated to be the next Western emperor, a man by the name of Inicius Olibrius. Olibrius was a wealthy leading senator from Rome and he had lots of good political ties both in the East and the West. The willingness of senators to support this new regime and to return to Rome rather than going to retreat in, in Italy on Constantinople was one key to their continuing influence. In fact, they had learned from earlier crises just 15 years earlier, senators had similarly returned quickly to Rome after the sack of 455 to support a new emperor. Once again, after the Civil War of 472, Wickham was sought several to of support for, for, for this new emperor. I'm going to close the door. Some, my neighbor is gardening and it's bothering me, so I'll be right back. Uh, ah, much better. Uh, I don't know if you could hear that, but it's annoying. Uh, so. Uh, it's, I think it's also important and interesting to note that Olivius and Rickmer um, gave clemency to all the senators who fought on the other side. Um, and that clemency, I would argue, um, facilitated the reunification of the aristocracy behind the new government of Olivius and Rickmer. In the aftermath, a unified Senate allied with the military and started the work of restoring Rome. And I'm gonna give you just one example of the kind of um, restoration efforts that um, made a difference in the recovery of the city of Rome. We happen to have a really good inscription that comes from the Roman Forum, or what's left of the Roman Forum. Behind, this is the Senate House, behind the Senate House in an area which is known as the Atrium of Minerva. That's a porticus or a vestibule um, alongside the Senate House. Um, it was named after the goddess Minerva that was dedicated by the first Roman emperor there, um, Augustus. Uh, inscription no longer survives. It, we hear about it in Renaissance books, neither does the statue obviously, but it can be very confidently reconstructed and it, it conveys really the, some of the motivation and the feeling behind of the individuals who started to rebuild the city in the wake of 472. Um, and this, uh, the inscription uh, reads um, in English, the statue of Minerva broken by a falling roof, destroyed by a fire during a civic conflict was restored by this guy, Nicias Achilles, uh, Aganatius Faustus. Um, he was a senator, he had lots of offices, urban prefect, kind of like mayor of Rome, um, for the happiness of the age. Now this restoration of a pagan statue by a man, certainly a Christian, attests to reverence for the site, as well as a revival of antiquarian sentiments. And I wanna emphasize the emotions that led to the choice of this statue. Clearly it's connected with a reverence for Rome's past. And this inscription also asserts what really was a standard Mediterranean idea that disaster strikes due to divine anger and that this is what was the cause of this recent civic conflict. And this phrase is reiterated in several other documents referring to what happened after 472. The prefect who undertook this work, uh, Nicias Achilles Agonantius Faustus, belonged to one of the most prominent imperial family, established families in Rome, that is the Anicii. 
there were other senators also who were involved in other work. Um, we have another senator, a member of the Petroni, who was attested as repairing, for instance, the baths of Constantine that were damaged also. And also, um, this is the kind of work that we can see duplicated again and again as the public spaces were rebuilt soon after 472. The Roman senators and alliances with military leaders also took on new diplomatic roles to ensure the survival of Italy and their own ongoing administration of its government. So in 476, we hear about um, the Senate and um, turning to a new, more powerful general after the death of Ricimer, they turned to a general, Odiaca, in order to uh, preserve the, the state in 476. And they sent an embassy to the Eastern Emperor um, to, to tell them uh, that they were perfectly fine with this resolution. As, they, as he said, uh, as, the, as the ambassador said, uh, there was no need of divided rule, and that one shared emperor was sufficient for both territories. That is the one shared emperor in Constantinople. We don't need an emperor in Rome. In fact, they had chosen Odoraka, a man of military and political experience, to safeguard Suzanne their own affairs, pragmata. And they said the emperor should confer upon him, that is Odoraka, uh, the government of Italy. Clearly, the Senate had been working with Odiaker uh, to resolve any tensions, and they didn't want the Eastern Emperor Zeno to intervene at all. Of course, the Eastern Emperor wasn't happy with this arrangement, but he didn't intervene. Uh, in fact, uh, there is little reason to suspect that the senators were anything but happy with this state of affairs. And we can see this if we look closely at the kinds of men who took high office during um, this period. Uh, I have collected, using inscriptions and textual evidences, I have um, collected information for these high civic office holders and, the, and their families. Um, some 87 were possible office holders and I've collected information for 16 of them. And if you uh, dissect these people individually, you can see certain patterns uh, that I won't go into at great length, other than to say that um, the established Roman families show up again and again. Uh, there are six powerful established Roman families whose members return again and again to hold high office. In particular, the family of the Dicius in green, the Dicius family, um, are very well re represented. But this is a kind of who's who of elite families. They did very well with this arrangement. So what I hope this part of my talk today has demonstrated, as has my book, is the resilience of senator aristocrats in alliance with the military to restore Rome as the center of political and social power in the fifth century. It became apparent to aristocrats in the wake of 472 that it was no longer desirable to have a resident Western emperor. The shared rulership model was no longer working for them. Certainly, the two other fifth century crises that I analyzed in my book, that of 410 and the 410 sack of Rome by Alec and the Goths and the 455 sack by, of the Vandals, these had demonstrated that the Senate and senators could hold power, but they needed a strong military elite with whom to work to provide protection. While I emphasize the resilience of Roman elites in response to the crisis of 472, the catastrophist paradigm focuses on this and other political and military events as setting the city and its inhabitants in an ever downward, virtually unavoidable spiral. This catastrophist approach has consistently underestimated the political and economic strength of Romans and their institutions, including the Senate over the long durée. But re so rather than dismiss the delegation sent in 476 from the Senate of Rome to the Eastern Emperor, the delegation that had asserted that one emperor in the East was enough, rather than dismissing that as the ineffectual actions of a weak Senate, I argue that the embassy was actually an expression of the chain's political goals of still powerful and wealthy Western senators. Their decision to align themselves with Odoacre mattered politically. 
Nor do I agree with those who are continuous because in fact, things fractured and broke. There were no longer was a Western emperor. But what about the church and the bishops of Rome, the popes, the institution and its leaders that come to the forefront of most studies of this period and of most who advance a continuous model, I should say. My research shows that the bishops and the church did not attain the influence nor the wealth to dominate society in Rome until the late sixth, early seventh century. That is from about another century and a half. Rather, lay aristocrats led the restoration of, Rome's, of Rome rather than the popes. And after each crisis, the bishops sought to rebuild their churches and their communities, that's for sure. But central aristocrats were critically important in this effort and not just as donors. Senator aristocrats were invited into the determination of papal successes in the late fifth century. They were successful in getting the bishops to uh, actually um, punish clergy who sold their donations because the uh, donors feared the loss of their salvation by such sales. And as I mentioned earlier, senator aristocrats were involved in what is today known as the Acacian Schism, when the Eastern Patriarch Acacius, with the Eastern Emperor's support, tried to force the Popes of Rome to agree to the Henoticon, a Christological formulation about the unity of the divine and human natures of Christ being unified, uh, a, a doctrine that went against the Chalcedonian formulation of the two natures of Christ. The senators were key supporters of papal resistance. With their support, and that about Acre, too. Um, the then Pope Felix in 484 excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople, Acacius, who in turn excommunicated Felix. The importance of Senator elites in this controversy is underscored by the letter of the Eastern Emperor um, at the time, Anastasius, um, who, who wrote to the Senate, urging the Senate to intervene to change the mind of the Pope. The Senate refused and they thus protected the Pope. In 518, the Eastern Patriarch backed down and after 30 years, the schism ended with the Pope and the Senate feeling duly vindicated. So despite the rhetoric of later bishops and modern scholars about the power of the Bishop of Rome from the time of Constantine's conversion in 312 on, my research underscores that the Popes remained weak public figures. The dominant influence of senator aristocrats in Rome in alliance with German military elites in Vienna brought relative prosperity. It benefited Rome and its elites for sure, but it also benefited, and I hasten to add, the non-elites whose lives were bound up with those in charge of the city. This happy state of affairs will continue until the interventions again of an Eastern emperor, Justinian in the sixth century. And uh, as I argue in the uh, next to last chapter of the book, Roman senatorial elites also survived the, the Justinian's wars, the Gothic wars, and they were poised for a comeback. Their demise uh, is owed to a large degree, I argue, to the failed reconstruction program that the Justinian and his successors put into place. Justinian's government, um, the, his reconstruction, undermined the traditions of traditional senatorial office holding and the competitive political culture that had fueled a resilient aristocracy. So in the early seventh century, the Senate as an autonomous institution disappears from view. To my mind, the end of the Senate represents the final fall of Rome as an ancient city. That is one in which the ideal of civic society inspired senatorial aristocrats and upwardly mobile provincials to serve the state. The Senate's passing is documented on the ground by the transformation of the Senate House, the Curia, and the Roman Forum. It became the Church of St. Hadrian under Pope Honorius. This act was rendered still more meaningful because Honorius was from one of the last of the Roman senatorial aristocratic families. Rather than serve the state, Honorius served the church. And for me, this uh, career choice marks the beginning of papal Rome. And how can this narrative be relevant today? My final thoughts. 
Rome's leaders, though working in competition with one another, were able to marshal their resources time and again to restore their city. Roman senators made an honest assessment of the real needs of their cities. Only by acknowledging the truth about the weakness of a resident Western emperor were they able to change their institutions. Similarly, after the more famous sack of Rome by Alaric and Legos in 410, the Senate had acknowledged the treachery of one of their own. The senators approved the punishment of the treacherous Attalus, cutting off as a thumb and forefinger the digits which were needed to deliver a public speech. Our leaders would do well to reflect on these Roman exemplars. Politicians, I think, should publicly acknowledge their responsibility for the January 6th attack, including the spreading of the big lie about the election. Only then can they take the necessary steps to repair and rebuild our capital as the Senate did their capital in late antiquity. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Michelle, thank for you. this fascinating time travel. <laughs> um, I, um, I'm encouraging everyone, you know, if you have questions um, to raise your hand or to uh, comment in the chat. If it's okay, I would like to create a very uh, quick transition between uh, your presentation, Michelle, and the Q and A, while everyone can, you know, take a minute to think about this and absorb. Um, for me, Rome has always been a fascinating city because it is this penultimate. It's just a, such a palimpsest, layer upon layer of what seems to be so many revivals. It's a city that just always bounces back um, in, a, in a way that I don't think many other cities do. And I really love the, um, you know, the idea of, um, very timely idea, obviously, of uh, going beyond a catastrophist approach and uh, think about how um, you know, people in the history uh, and people today can learn from crises, um, deep societal crises that that you know, of course, permeate permeate individual lives um, and produce stories of trauma. But they also um, they also produce stories of resilience, you know, and and they produce stories of uncertainty, but also of stoicism. So um, the the way Rome is constructed and the way Rome keeps on being uh, and thinking about itself really as a center of the Western world for me always has been um, very very fascinating. I wanted to come back to um, something that you mentioned at the beginning, kind of a light motif that um, then came back again, um, the idea of the competition amongst elites or within um, a, a, a group of um, you know elite elitist rulers. It seems to be such a strong paradigm in Italian culture. Also, I mean, in you know, in the in the Renaissance that emulates antiquity to such a high degree, where the idea of superare, while you belong to a certain firm group, societal group, um, you also want to be the best within this group, and you instrumentalize. You showed the Minerva statue. Um, what is there in terms of the arts? Um, and, and, you know, you're not shy about making, uh, you know, leaving large inscriptions <laughs> with your name in them. So the instrumentalization of the of one's own past, a city's own past is something that I've, I've seen in Rome over, you see it everywhere on every street corner. Um, and I, it's just such a, you know, a long paradigm. It's, it seems to survive the times despite this client declines and falls. But if you could say a little more about that competition does it show uh, in the arts? Does it show in in other forms of commissions? I'm just interested in the concept. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you for that um, uh, comment. Uh, and it shows up in so many ways. You know, in the in the late Republic, the competition for uh, being uh, leading an army, you know, which is the sort of is a sort of traditional uh, Roman way of competing, um, uh, often has very negative results because you would compete to become consul. Um, but in late antiquity, uh, uh, that is the last three to four centuries of the Roman Empire, um, there still is that competition for public service, and, and that's what I service, which is what I've been mostly focusing on. 
Um, and so competing to leave your, literally leave your name on, on monuments is, is um, very endemic to the value or the worth of somebody. Um, and what's, what I find particularly interesting in, in the late antique period, it's just part of the culture from, from the, the late reform, you know, for centuries. But what is kind of, what is new and exciting or different in, in the fourth century is the introduction of Christianity. So you see mm. com competition for who will be more noble by donating money, not just for civic buildings, but also to the church. You know, and in Rome, you have these, um, you have through the end of this period, um, I would argue, um, autonomous neighborhood churches that owe their economic dependence on senators, even though they're nominally under the bishop. So you still have, you, so this competition takes multiple forms. Um, and so, um, even in uh, in the Basilica, the Papal Basilica of St. Peter's, you have aristocrats competing to donate various uh, monuments. We hear about them. So, so you have this explosion of competition across not just the political world, but the social and religious world in new ways in, in the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries after Constantine. Um, so you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, the one area that we we it's hard to document artistic competition, but there's literary competition. You know, I translated um, the only English translation with a friend of mine, Michael Roberts, of the Letters of Semicus. Um, I was intrigued because he was a, a one of the most eminent orator of the fourth century, and his letters haven't been translated into English yet, although then will nine books. But he was competing with others to, you know, to be as the most, another Cicero, as it were. Um, so there was literary competition as well. In the arts, not so much, but uh, that was, that was, uh, but, but certainly in cultural um, productions, in the production of, of um, letter writing and in history as well, you see other ways of trying to outcompete each other. Mm. So. Interesting things are happening on the crossroads between, you know, thinking vertically uh, of the homogeneity of a certain um, societal uh, ruling class or group uh, and thinking, um, thinking horizontally and thinking vertically about standing out amongst those, uh, amongst the peers as a motivating, highly motivating factor, obviously. But I'm opening up um, the, um, the Q&A to all of you. Coraggio. <laughs> I should have silence everybody. Steven. Hey, Michelle. Hi, Steve. Love the paper. And, and just a question. I mean, you, um, was it in Zocalo? You did have a, have a recent sort of opinion piece in, uh, published in which you made the, the parallel you finished with between sort of the, the way in which the Roman Senate rehabilitated itself and sort of a call for how we may do a similar thing in our one wishes we could um, post January 6th. Did you get any response to that? Has that been something that um, other commentators have picked up the deep historical parallels between sacking of, 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 a, of a democracy and attempts to sort of recreate credibility um, after uh, insurrectionists um, attempt to destroy the government. Thank, yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Steve. Um, uh, well, I know that that piece was picked up in the Bangkok Times, <laughs> um, and so um, there has been. I've had some people write about uh, how this is a, a useful way of thinking about the, the present times, as it were. Um, I haven't had uh, um, a political, no, no, politi no politician has changed their mind on the basis of that, but it's been, um, I have had people respond to it uh, um, online, actually. So, um, so uh, yeah, so that it has had some 
people have written to me individually that they've been struck by the parallels. Although I must say the uniform, um, the one thing that everybody seems to notice or wonder about is why, uh, why the Senate removed um, Adolescent's two digits, and those are the, the, the speaking hands, the sort of public speaking um, hands as uh, uh, digits. And so that was the punishment, which I think is very apt, actually. So people who have written to me have, have mentioned that and wondered about um, you know, silencing, uh, not being able to silence contemporary senators quite so easily. Uh, thanks for that question. Alejandra. Hi, Michelle, thank you so Hi. much for your talk. I had a question, but it was just on a little point. I know nothing about this time period and really enjoy learning about it. But my question was about sort of this like historiographical intervention you're making or you, uh, about sort of the when the, the role of the church and how it's been uh, document, like how scholars keep place, placing it in the fifth century and you've sort of found, found that sort of its effects and impact being much later in time than, than people have account. I, I was very curious about sort of like how you came to that and um, how you found this discrepancy. I'm always very curious to see how people are like, how do you measure like church success? Um, I think about this a lot when people write about like successful missions. I think, oh, how do you, how do we measure this? So I was just very curious to think um, how, like, what is your process to try to figure, figure this out and figure out the impact of the church as it waxes and wanes? Uh, Alejandra, that's a great question. Thank you for it. Um, many, um, most of the documents that I'm using are produced by Christian bishops and authors. Um, something, the biographies of the popes were written in the sixth century, and they and they um, fictionalize or they expand on the impact of the bishops from the time of um, uh, Peter, Saint Peter on. Um, and so, um, you know, historians don't rely on them, and yet they kind of do. And once Constantine has converted, there is, you know, an influx, an influx of um, wealth coming into the church. We hear about buildings, church buildings in particular, uh, are measured. Uh, so, uh, so that's one way that a lot of historians have said, well, you know, we have these church buildings, these basilicas, so therefore Rome has become a Christian city. But if you look where these church buildings are, they're not in the center of Rome, they're on the outskirts, they are limited, it's not really where people go. Um, if you look more at the at the neighborhood churches and, and the, the, the public roles given to religious figures, that's what I was interested in. You know, you often, you will read, well, the Pope takes over Rome and he feeds the people and he oversees the water supply. So one, um, one article that I wrote, you know, traced who actually feeds the people of Rome. Uh, the food supply, which is still working through this period, um, is controlled by magistrates and by senators, not by the Pope. And so, so there's those kinds of documents. Um, I've read a lot of papal letters that survive. Well, that is Pope's letters um, where, uh, where they talk about their limitations and the problems and the money they don't have. So I've used a lot of the documents which other people have used on the other, to talk about the power of the popes, um, to argue against that power, to say that no, it was much more limited much, and it's been very exaggerated. So um, there are a lot of uh, those documents. In fact, one of the things that I think is really you know, I'm not a church historian, so I'm not interested in theology, really. I could talk about the occasion schism, but I don't really, you know, I don't really get all the, um, I don't really care about the theological divisions that much. But when you actually read about the letters, for instance, of um, the Pope at the time, Felix, you see he's trying to negotiate, he's politically insecure. Um, and the, the letter that um, that the um, Eastern Emperor wrote to the Senate, I found in a collection of documents that I still not translated this. I have a lot of collection in a monastery in, in um, Avalana. Um, uh, people just haven't looked at me because they're most church historians. So they don't notice that the Senate is saying, no, we're not gonna do that. So those are the kinds of things that I've kind of woven into the narrative um, and read on the other, you know, to, to look at this institution. 
Sweet. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Tom had his hand up, but now it moved away. What happened? <laughs> Just a minute, sorry. Uh, Michelle, sorry, I wasn't going to intervene. Um, what I loved about this and all your work about this is showing the vitality of the city of Rome, okay, the various institutions in action. And is it, this is a question, and again, I'm a complete outsider. Is it a question that when the emperor in the West goes away, so when the Roman Empire, whatever was there, disappears in 476, is it a question that the city of Rome picks up its game or has it always been much more involved in the running of great question the empire or is it has it been have the local authorities been fairly quiescent in previous centuries or are they suddenly moved to fill in the gap once the emperor goes they uh it's the latter in fact but they in fact it's a growing um i would argue that from the fourth century on you see a an increase in the power of the senatorial elites in the senate and etc et which is explodes or is accentuated by the removal of the resident Western emperor. Because um, in the, the fourth century, it's a time of great wealth. Um, and there's a kind of recovery and a reemergence of um, senatorial power uh, after a third century, after about third century decline. So uh, this picks up a lot as the well, as the Western emperor becomes weaker and weaker over the course of the fifth century, the senators become all the more powerful and the Senate takes on a lot of different roles. So they become more directly involved in diplomacy. They become actors in negotiations with the removal of the Western Roman emperor. Yes, they become much more actively involved in taking leading roles. So um, yeah. I realize they're kind of at the, the far end of, you know, far away from Constantinople and they have to operate. They don't want to do anything to, I assume, to really alienate the other emperor, the one that survived. But do they ever in this sense, because the Senate is expanding its powers, do they ever begin reviving memories of the Republic? Not really. <laughs> they, I mean, they, it, it's interesting. A, yeah, okay. They, yeah. they, um, they, I mean, it's embedded in, in who they are, but they are much more see themselves in terms of the empire, right? Because they see, uh, from their point of view, the empire exists without a, Western, without a Western Roman emperor. The emperor is in the East. And in fact, in fact, they never talk about Rome falling. That is invented in the sixth century by Justinian when he tries to justify coming back to take over control of the West. It's not an idea that is really contemporary to the fifth century. So that's a so that's a it's it's kind of interesting. The Republic is not what they want anymore. They want it, they are an empire. They don't think that they've fallen. They think that they they are Romans uh, and they have an emperor. He's just in Constantinople, no longer in Rome. But what and I love about it is the, the confidence of the elite, I'm sorry to carry on, is they go, no, we don't really need an emperor. <laughs> it's true. They it's an easy one. We, we're happy enough without an emperor over here. Yeah. Life is much easier. Yeah. Well, it, this it's um, I've syncopated. Um, uh, it, it, it's 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 a situation that's evolved over the course of about fifty years, where they have this um, combination of a, you know, a weak emperor and a strong military. Um, and it doesn't really work. There's this conflict, you know, that I mentioned earlier between Anthemius. Um, and Rickmer, you know, that's typical. So get rid of the, the middle guy, you know, get rid of the Western emperor. And, and we just have one that's, that's not going to get involved in running mostly Italy and, and Gaul. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. The confidence is true, but it's, it's born of also experience. You know, there's a, a vertical need, you know, uh, rulers need these, these are the people who know how to read, write, administer, have wealth, servants, clients. So there's a, there's a kind of um, societal need being met on both sides. Yeah. We have two more uh, questions, one, one in the chat and then Georgia has her hand up. 
um, uh, so George Michael's uh, question is, to what extent did the composition of the senatorial elite change and what about the Germanic element? Oh, thank you, Georg. Uh, uh, it, it certainly changed. One of the um, strengths of the aristocracy is that even though the names remain uh, the same, they do incorporate many um, new provincial families. And um, we even hear about Germans, <laughs> Germanic um, military leaders who rise to become consuls, uh, there's a wonderful general, this guy named Verlilla, who comes to live in Rome, buys a house, donates a church, gets a seat on the Colosseum. We have an inscription with his name on it. So we see upward mobility um, among, uh, for certain Germans, as it were, within uh, the, the Senate and the senatorial aristocracy. So that is, I think, one of the great strengths of the aristocracy is that they or claim to be have families that go back for centuries and centuries, but they also absorb new um, new families, new provincial types. Yeah. Oh God, did I just mispronounce a fellow German's name? Is it Georg Michels? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, apologies. <laughs> All right, um, Georgia. So. Um, I, I, I guess I didn't see your piece about uh, what we can do in the United States to restore some kind of functional nation. <laughs> uh, but I was wondering what you thought the difference might be. I mean, the, the idea of our senators bestirring themselves or being capable of doing anything is so ridiculous, right? I mean, all they can do is yell at each other and call each other names. So. What do you think the difference is? Wonderful question. Um, well, what I what I said, I'll send you the Zocalo piece okay. after this, Georgia. What I said was that it began, the only way to begin to recover after Elric Sack was to acknowledge that one of their own Atlas had betrayed them. Um, he went over, um, he was a, a pseudo emperor as they were. He, he, he seized the moment um, and became emperor in uh, for, for 10, for nine um, and uh, tried to use it for his own advantage. Um, he was later deposed, caught, um, and then came back to Rome and in a very public execution <laughs> of its fingers, um, he was punished with the support of the senators. And so the peace in Zoklo was really, you know, the first step towards any kind of uh, American resolution would be to acknowledge on the part of those who are involved that they were guilty and that, that they should be punished um, openly. Um, uh, and, and following the exemplar, um, exiled if uh, uh, afterwards. So that was my you know, clarion call at the beginning of the of the um, Senate investigation, the House investigations. You know, if we are to reflect on what the Romans did, and they succeeded. You know, after the famous sack of four ten, the city revived again. You know, smaller, admittedly, but um, it was able to recover economically, population, politically. Um, um, but my uh, goal wish was that um, uh, we should be as fortunate as the Romans were and have leaders who are honestly uh, are honest about those who um, who err, and um, that punishment is a way to is the only way to proceed before in order to rebuild. So that was the hope. <laughs> I uh, don't know whether it'll work, but you know, one can hope. <laughs> well, I guess the uh, the Republican National Committee has now called it a an expression, a, a, a legitimate expression of citizens or whatever. Yeah. So there doesn't seem to be much hope of. Um, well, you know, one can change. You know, there's a and also the wait, right. The right wing has used a lot of of what um, of Roman history 
uh, with opposite messages. Right? You know, they've looked at the fall of Rome as uh, as uh, as the decline of civic values, and the barbarians are the Democrats. So, you know, this was an attempt to counter um, this alternative narrative that one finds in writing writing sources often. So, classics has often been used uh, in by conservatives. So I want to I wanted to stake out a claim um, for an, for another position. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. That's probably necessary recurses to contemporary politics. Uh, I wanted to, we're, we've reached the end of what I think was a terrific uh, afternoon hour. Thank you all for joining us uh, with that wonderful weather outside um, for being here in the Zoom room with us. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to quote one of our participants. Thank you for a wonderful prissy of your book, Michelle. Um, you. Yes, so thank you all. And I hope to see you again part of the presses and have a nice afternoon everyone yeah. bye, bye. Thank you for having me great absolutely bye bye, bye, -bye.